to a show on science tonight. Maybe it will be a wonderful show tonight. Musical theater science programming. Are you watching? Are you truly edutained? Mm, I like mm. to be edutained. I like to be edutained too. You know, sometimes I feel like just breaking into like Professor Doofenshmirtz's voice. He is really the greatest all time, you know? It's talking like that. And you go, oh, I don't know what I'm talking about. <sighs> Doofenshmirtz Incorporated. This is not that show, though. This is This Week in Science, starting in three, two, this is Twiss. This Week in Science, episode number 663, recorded on Wednesday, March 21st, 2017. Doodles of Science! Hey everybody, I am Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we are going to fill your heads with doodles, toad troubles, and a rogue. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer! The wonderful thing about the world we are living on, if you haven't noticed it by now, is that it is covered with living things. So many planets in our solar system without life, so much of the universe apparently uninhabitable. And yet this one planet, this one we live on, life is abundant. It is everywhere we have looked. And it should come as no surprise that with all this teeming resplendent abundance, we would want to learn everything we can about it. So that's what we're going to do here on This Week in Science. Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening. What's happening. Science. Science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We're back yet again. And once again, another wonderful week of science. All sorts of wonderful stories out there. Something we will not be talking about tonight is how fairness in housework, house chores, leads to better satisfaction in, re in, in relationships. <laughs> oh, we, my. We that be. sounds like a little peek behind the curtain at the Stanford household. We won't be talking about that tonight. <laughs> what we will be talking about. No. Some some great stories. I have stories about some sciencey doodles, a rogue star, and almost also some plastic because you know plastic. Huh. That's right, Justin. What did you bring? I've got some uh, Neander news. Big Neander news. A duo of Dennis Ovens and why Texas is such a sinkhole of a state. Sinkhole? Oh. Why is it? We'll find out in a moment. Blair, what is in the animal corner? Ooh, I brought some cane toad sex calls. I brought uh, batty conversations. And I brought taste bud death. What? <laughs> That's terrible. I like my taste buds. I like tasting things. I think you'll be fine. Okay, I'll be fine. Wonderful. Yeah, you'll be fine for sure. Good. Well, I like to I like to start this show off just fine, and I will start it off for show sure by reminding you all that if you have not done so yet, you can subscribe to our podcast. Please do so. In fact, if you love the sounds of science on a weekly basis, uh, you can find information at twist.org if you're interested, or you can search for This Week in Science, all good places where podcasts are found, and YouTube and Facebook. Let's start it off with some really good news. Really good news, okay? So we have talked on this show, brought up this example over and over and over again 
of the experiments in which researchers ask kids to draw pictures of scientists. And what do they draw? Uh, a white haired old man in a lab coat with a uh, bubbling flask. Right. And an accent. And an accent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. And it talks German like or... this. Even. I can talk like that even. Okay. Eyes. Yeah. Okay. Well, so that was how it was for sure back in the 60s and even the 70s. In the 60s and 70s, 99.4%. No, not 100%, but really pretty close there of kids who were given these, these tasks drew a male scientist. That's a big proportion. In the 80s, that percentage dropped to about three quarters, 72%, so almost 75%. 72% of kids were, were drawing men. A quarter were starting to draw women or other, other individuals. So by the 2010s... Wait, 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 wait. Hey, I have to pause you right there. The decade we're in now... Wait, wait, I got to pause you for a second before you move on. Yes? 72%. Was men. Yeah, pictures. 72% of the pictures that children drew were Men's of male scientists. scientists. But then you said the other was women or other. Well, What's the well, other? Like some are dog <laughs> scientists? Like well, were throwing it's not men. <laughs> the just, other it's quarter. Not men. We're not men. <laughs> it's a yes. duck. But it's still. It's, okay. By, the, by this decade, the decade we are in now. One in three drawings portrays a female scientist. Oh, not bad. It's moved getting better. percent or maybe more if you if the other one didn't have ducks. Yeah. One in three drawings portrays a female scientist. Now, researchers who have published this work, uh, these, the lead researcher, David Miller, a psychology researcher at Northwestern University, says this is probably the result of increasing numbers of women becoming scientists and also mass media, such as television and children's shows. And these are featuring women more often. So what we see is not the same old image all the time that kids are starting to see the change in, in representation and to reflect that change as well. So interesting points here though, are how, uh, how stereotypes change as children age. So from the 80s until now, 30% of girls and 83% of boys that were six years old drew male scientists. The interesting thing here is by age 16, the older ages, teenagers, 70%, 75% of girls and 98% of boys drew male researchers. And so older kids seem to link men with science more than younger kids do, which I think is a very interesting, interesting point. And this could be something that is not in the good news vein at this point in time, but that uh, the teenagers who are the ones who are going to be looking into careers and really starting to delve into what they're going to do for college and where they're going to go with their lives, that this is where we need to really be putting our efforts. But at the same time, they weren't necessarily looking at these children longitudinally through their lifetimes. So we're just comparing, you know, in 1986, this many six-year-olds versus this many 16-year-olds or these studies were showing this response. But uh, this seems as though this would be an age group, the teenage age group would be one to target specifically to increase this understanding that women are scientists too yes they are but <laughs> but okay so one of the things that i would i would look at in this too is is how much do these teenagers even know about scientists right mm -hmm. and if they're learning about the history of science What's the first name that anybody can go is like, oh, that guy's a scientist. It's Einstein. Einstein right? Like yeah. this is like and and because of a critical pivotal role in our understanding of the universe that we live in, 
he's going to be talked about quite a bit, right? Um, and you get into into um, quantum, and what do you start talking about? Oh, well, Niels Bohr, right? Okay, there's another guy. It's another guy, and it from the same era. Right? Um, also, I would I would I would want to I'd want to throw into this like, if it was possible, just to see how many like would confer a scientist more likely. Uh, in a black and white image and then one that was in color. Like which one of these is a scientist? One's in black and white, one's a color. Both guys, you know, whatever, same age and everything. I bet you most people pick the black and white image just because this is what we see when we talk about science, when we people when people are teaching about science. You know, also our our science communicators over time. Um wh whether you're you're talking, you know, um about the, uh, what's his name with the, the with the British accent who does all the narrations? David Attenborough. Attenborough. You got Brian Sagan. Cox. You've got you Carl got, Sagan. You've a, got, a well, there's a couple day. things going on there too. Is with TV, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of older women on television. <laughs> so yeah. that's part of it. Is that men are allowed to age and women are not? <laughs> um, no, I think everybody it, doesn't have a choice in that. Um, no, hold on, I'm not done. But <laughs> the other problem is that if you're talking about teenagers, a huge problem that teenagers have, and this is something we've talked about a lot on this show, is that as a woman, you're kind of told to pick, are you going to be popular and pretty? Or are you going to be smart? Mm -hmm. And so teenagers, hey, that's right when that's starting to happen. Am I going to start dating boys? Or am I going to start, you know, to follow a scientific track or a math track or an engineering track. And this is something that we're fighting against. And I think we're making a lot of strides on, but it's still something that has to be looked at and addressed. And that's what's, I think is potentially really exciting about this. And I think the big sure. place that is going to be influential right now is actually social media, Instagram, not, not all the other social media accounts necessarily, but Instagram, where a lot of teenagers are hanging out and there are a large number of female scientists on Instagram curating beautiful images of their work, of their interests, also of their lives, showing well-rounded lives with interests in the arts and culture and food and animals and clothes and kind of showing that you can have all of these things and love science at the same time. And so I think through something like Instagram, if not Instagram itself, that in this will help to reach teenagers and that audience. Um, and then we'll also add to it that, of course, there's, you know, you have cohorts of children getting older. And so those six-year-olds are going to get older eventually. And I think this is a trend. It's a major shift from, you know, less than one in a hundred children find imagining a scientist being a woman to about 30%, you know, a little over 30% of kids seeing scientists as women. And so what this shows is that communication, like what we do here, and what many others are working very hard on to, uh, to represent the, the various natures of people in the sciences, that it eventually will trickle down to understanding and this will get and it, it, yeah. it'll, it's growing this is a positive trend and so that is my that was my good news take home from yeah. this story and now I, no, I'm now gonna no excuse myself from making the the title nine comparison again but you yeah i agree it's getting better it's getting better and that is good mm -hmm. we'll keep keep up the efforts right and one day your daughters, Justin, are going to be carrying the banner of science and changing the world for us. And so this is what it's about. We'll keep keep putting it out there. So change in science, that's a big thing. But you know what's even bigger? Changing the orbits of objects in the solar system. That is a big deal. <laughs> I'm against it. Uh, <laughs> Like, what could go wait, wrong? What? What could go why wrong would we want to do that? Or why is it happening? Do you ever wish you could change the orbit of your planet? planet? <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so we're not wanting that to happen, especially in our solar system. It's working pretty well for us the way it is. We don't we don't need any more objects being 
uh, dislodged from the Oort cloud and no. being sent hurtling to the inner planets of the solar system where they could interact with us and go boom in a very negative way for humanity and the rest of life on the Earth. But historically, that is something that very well may have happened. A few years back, or people have been talking about these objects that they're following in the solar system, the orbital paths of various of planets and also of these asteroids that are out, these objects, or cloud objects, the asteroid belt objects, these things that are in our solar systems going around, going around, right? Well, some of them are on these odd trajectories. And how did they get that way? And this hypothesis has been put forward that, oh, there's a rogue planet. Oh, there's a rogue star. Something interacted with our solar system. And so a team of astronomers in 2015 published uh, an article suggesting that there was a star that is called the Schultz star that actually came close and kind of brushed through our, our Oort cloud about 70,000 years ago and caused them some things to move. But the data, you know, it's like, okay, is that really? Okay, do we have enough data on that? And so some astronomers from Complutense University in Madrid, Carlos and Raul de la Fuente Marcos, with a researcher, Svere J. Arseth of the University of Cambridge, looked at 340 objects in the solar system that have hyperbolic orbits, which are kind of open V-shaped, kind of like a big U or a V-shaped orbit and not the elliptical orbit that is standard for most objects in the solar system. And they found the trajectory that of some of them is probably influenced by this star, the Schultz star. They write, using numerical simulations, we've calculated the radiance or positions in the sky from which all of these hyperbolic objects seem to come. In principle, one would expect those positions to be evenly distributed in the sky, particularly if the objects come from the Oort cloud. However, what we find is very different. A statistically significant accumulation of radiance, the pronounced overdensity appears projected in the direction of the constellation Gemini, which fits the close encounter with Schultz's star. Now, Schultz's star is about 20 light years away at this point in time. And I was doing a little uh, back, of the, back of the envelope, well, actually my notebook calculation to kind of see how fast that means it would have, had, would, would have to be traveling. And so it would be traveling almost three times faster than the Earth is currently in orbit around the Earth. So it's a pretty quickly moving star, some 190,000 miles and now miles a second or so, no, 100,000 miles and miles an hour, maybe. I think that 190,000 miles an hour is what I came up with. Um, but it's very interesting to think that a star thrown out of its orbit somehow, or even in this strange orbit in our galaxy, that it bumped into ours and made some things move in a way that that we're just seeing the effects now and we're watching them now. Um, so the researchers say it could be coincidence, but it's unlikely that both location and time are compatible and their simulations suggest that Schultz star approached even more than 0.6 light years away from our the Oort cloud from our solar system. Hmm. Yeah, so 70,000 years ago, Schultz's star, which is a binary red dwarf system with really tiny, it's only about 9% the mass of the sun. And uh, there's a little brown dwarf that orbits around it. This little tiny brown dwarf orbits around the red dwarf. They're not very big, but they're moving kind of fast. And they're just these rogue, this rogue binary star system. And it's possible 70,000 years ago that it would have been visible to early humans, ancient humans, standing on the plains, looking up in the sky as a reddish light 
that they would have seen it actually get close enough at that point in time wow. if they were looking up and following the stars in that way. Wild. So, yeah. so this happened 70,000 years ago. And... Yeah, little drive-by star system. And then it's like, Trip, I'm out of here. Sorry. Just a little gravitational <laughs> riptide our way. And yeah. we're just now seeing these Oort cloud objects zipping our way, huh? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, well, they're not zipping our way. They're just not in the usual direction of all Oort cloud objects. But uh, the question is, you know, these hyperbolic objects, you know, what other interstellar asteroids? We've got Oumuamua, right, <laughs> that came and did a drive-by through our solar system. And um, what other stars and planets and interstellar objects could have interacted or are still interacting with our solar system that we're not aware of. We're part of it. Our solar system is part of a system. And we're not just alone in space. We get bumped into occasionally. <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> exactly. Do they buzz excuse me like bees? Whoop, excuse me. Whoop. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I don't know if I don't know if the stars do that. No. Probably not. No. The stars are rude. <laughs> so going back 70,000 years, is that far enough back to get to Neanderthals? Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You don't really have to go nearly that far back. Uh, in fact, what have I got here? Uh, researchers at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology have sequenced the last of the Neanderthals. Got uh, at least five Neanderthals that lived between 39,000 and 47,000 years ago. Uh, these, uh, this is much more recent uh, genome sequencing than we've had. We've had much older uh, uh, DNA to work with thus far. These are much more closely related to those who contributed DNA to modern and modern humans, uh, right? or the ancestors of. They would have contributed their DNA to the Neanderthals that then became interbred uh, with, with humans. So previous whole genome sequences have been generated for four Neanderthals, Croatia, Siberia, and the Russian Caucasus. This study adds five more from Belgium, France, Croatia, and Russia. Uh, they're a little wider geographic area here, so we get a little bit better spread of this and more recent time period. So. With this Neander news, researchers can now begin to put together the history of Neanderthals a little bit. They compared these Neanderthal genomes to the genomes of people living today, showed that uh, all of the late Neanderthals were more similar to the Neanderthals that did contribute to the DNA. When, when you go in there on your 23andMe or whatever it is, and you find out, oh, I'm 2% Neanderthal, that's uh, likely these Neanderthals that it's referring to. So even though four of these Neanderthals that they sequenced lived at a time when modern humans had already begun arriving in Europe, they do not carry detectable amounts of modern human DNA. And quotey voice, it may be that gene flow was mostly unidirectional from Neanderthals into modern humans, according to Svante Pabo, director of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. So... That means that the the Neander, at least in this scenario, the Neanderthal offspring would have likely been raised amongst humans from a Neander human commingling, which might mean uh, the Neander man and the Neander female. You might you might extract that from that, but not necessarily. Uh, but there's also a potential mystery. Uh, they noticed that the the Neanderthals have sort of genetic similarity, which is correlated with their geographical location. Uh, but they can see that there was, towards the, the very end of Neanderthal history, they were moving and replacing each other a little bit in areas. So Neanderthals made towards the end of their existence as freestanding hominids on this planet may have been moving around quite a bit um and so we've we've often talked about one of the potentials is that humans fought with or outcompeted directly neanderthal populations it could be that the neanderthals that were still around were just moving away from humans 
and getting into conflicts with other Neanderthals. <laughs> uh, so that's so it's a really fascinating uh, first glimpse into, and they think that they have a, a way of collecting DNA from these archaic hominids now that may accelerate the ability to, the, to do this in the future. They just need to find more bones. And there was a, another story that, uh, that you sent me, Kiki, that was about Denise events. They did a genetic sort of mapping of populations in Asia uh, and East Asia and in uh, Papua New Guinea, I guess, or Papua Indiv Papun individuals. And it, it kind of was sort of an interesting thing. So we, we only have like a finger of a Denisovan that we've mm -hmm. been able to figure out these things existed. Yeah. Uh, and there's a 5% Denisovan ancestry uh, in Papan individuals, which is sort of an interesting thing, right? Um, what, what's, uh, what they discovered through this, though, is that there was not just one, but at least two different infusions or two different co-mingling events with Denisovans and modern humans. One that's, uh, and, they, and they base this because that one that they found in the Siberian cave is closer to some Denisovan ancestry, but kind of far removed from the other Denisovan ancestry. So it was, it was not equally related to the Denisovan genetics that modern humans carry, uh, which indicates that there's very likely not one, but two separate events, at least, uh, for Denisovan and modern human intermingling. That's interesting. So the, the populations came together, separated, came together, separated, or different tribes of people came together, then mixed together, like that there could have been these multiple paths of these didn't these Denisovans, even though we don't have a lot of their bones, they got around. Keep popping up. They do. Yeah. And I don't think it's Papua New Guinea. It's just popping. They're Papuan. Papuan. Thank you. Papuan. Papuan. Yeah. I mean that's that's significant. There's a a significant percentage of Denisovan in these in these individuals. So what even is a species? <laughs> right? I mean, well, yeah. I mean, when we're talking about we're soup now. <laughs> right? These ancient humans. Yeah, that's what we should just call it. Ancient human soup. Yeah. That's right. What's the Latin word for soup? That's what we need. <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> uh, so the, the the phraseology that's being thrown about quite a bit in anthropological circles uh is braided strain right soup so, in latin pulmenti pulmenti there you go homo pulmenti that's yeah. what we <laughs> so a braided stream is the term that they're using yeah be uh, because even going back further you know it was the the old the uh, archetypal idea is you had this, it evolved into that, it split off at some point, and then that one died off, but this one continued and it split off. And so, like a stream, it, it you know, sort of breaks up and has tributaries that go off and that sort of thing. Um, but what it really looks more like is like, no, actually, this came back over here, remerged, and then this went on for a while, and then, oh, and then this came in and it joined, but then it went off and it became this over here. And so it, it keeps going back in lots of intermingling. And, as long as it walks like a human and kind of looks human-ish, that's apparently good enough for hominids. It's, then it's a uh, French braid. Yeah, we're, <laughs> yeah, we're not well, perhaps a good. fish tail. Who even knows? Fish tail, that's right. What kind of braid is it? A fancy one. It's a fancy braid. Fancy one. Pigtails yeah. even. Yeah, but these stories, I mean, this is... It, since the advent of, of being able to investigate genetic information more rapidly, we're getting more and more of these stories and they're, you know, little find is revealing so much more information than it once did. And so um, a finger bone, a pile of teeth, you know, things that used to be, okay, well, I think this, you know, these traits of these things suggest that this is the, what, you know, what happened. Now it's, so much richer and we're actually able to follow this braid through time. That's yeah. yeah. It's amazing. That is amazing. I like it. I like braiding my hair too. <laughs> but you know, 
you know what time it is right now, everybody? <gasps> it's time for Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creatures. Great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. Want to hear about animals? She's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. That are both I have cane toad news. <laughs> so, oh, okay. <laughs> cane toads, also known as marine toads, they're kind of the poster child for why introduced species are never a good idea. Uh, listeners to the show have heard me kind of um, rant. I guess, about introduced species several times, and they're a great example. Cane toads, originally from Central and South America, were introduced a bunch of different places. They were introduced to Australia, Florida, Papua New Guinea, speaking of Papua, the Philippines, um, islands off the coast of Japan, a bunch of the Caribbean islands, Fiji, Pacific Islands, Hawaii. It, they've been introduced to a lot of places, pretty much always islands, because I feel like that's always the answer to, oh, well, if it gets out of control, at least it'll it'll just be on the island. It'll be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem is, there's a few problems. The first is they were all introduced to eat different pests, depending on the island. Cane toads are awake at night and in the very early morning. A lot of the prey animals that they were released to eat awake in the middle of the day. Cane toads hang out on land on the ground level. They are not great jumpers. Most toads are not. They don't have the right back legs for it. A lot of the locusts and beetles that they were brought in to eat hang out at the top of sugarcane plants. I'm laughing because right now I'm thinking, yeah, you never hear about toads legs on the menu. Yeah, they're not impressive. Um, <laughs> Also, cane toads get really big. They can get about eight inches in their largest. And so they eat things a lot bigger than bugs. They eat small mice. They eat rats. One of the places they were introduced, they were actually brought on to eat rats. And they eat small birds, other frogs and toads, lizards. They so, eat each other. Yeah, they eat each other. So not well thought out to say the least. A lot of the places they were released, like in Hawaii and in Australia, they didn't eat what they were brought to eat. But on top of it all, marine toads, cane toads have a very special poison gland called a parotid gland that secretes a neurotoxin. So in Central and South America, there are animals that have evolved alongside them to eat them. Things like caiman, certain snakes, a lot of uh, birds have actually figured out how to flip them over and just eat their stomach so they avoid the gland altogether. But you put them on these new habitats and the local predators don't know what to do. They get poisoned by these animals or they learn to avoid them, which is what the, what the response is for, right? And so as a result, in 1935, when they were released in Australia, they released 102 toads. They didn't come from their native Central and South America. They came from Hawaii, the stock in Hawaii that they thought was going so well at the time <laughs> to eat cane beetles on the sugar cane crops. There are now an estimated guess. I don't know. There's got to be like in the thousands, tens of how many. Justin? Uh, I would put it in the multi-millions. 1.5 billion toads. Oh, billion! In Australia. <laughs> wow! Yeah. So um, they're very adaptable. They reproduce quickly. They're mobile. They can co cover up to a kilometer at night, which, as Justin would say, is about 1,000 meters. Just about. Yeah, and they can <laughs> hitch rides on trucks. They can... They can <laughs> They can even sometimes hitch rides on planes in the landing equipment. <laughs> so they have spread across Australia in these past oh my goodness eighty quick, years quick, to quick. yeah. Uh, the, just, I'm look. I just looked up cane toe just because that was such a cute picture. I want to see another yeah. one. Uh, it says here a female's clutch size, uh -huh. which I think is the number of number uh, of eggs. Yeah, uh, number of eggs. 
8,000 to 25,000. Right. So again, in their native habitat, the majority of those would be eaten. Mm. Yeah. But there's also less likelihood that in a non-native habitat, there would be animals looking to eat those eggs. So all this kind of compounds and has created this population explosion. Problem being, they're eating other animals' food, they're out-competing for space, and they're poisoning native animals. So this is a problem. It's an epidemic. And up until now, the majority of eradication efforts have been focused on capturing and killing individual toads, which as you can imagine, if it's only if it's 1.5 billion toads, it's not very effective. So a new study looking at different trap opportunities um, decided to this is from James Cook University in partnership with Animal Control Technologies Australia wanted to see how they could use kind of the toad's uh, motivation against them. So what are the two things a toad cares about? Food and sex, right? As with most animals. And so the two things that they did is they played with different male cane toad calls because the calls usually are used to attract females. So the males call to attract females. But what they found in their research was that both males and females were attracted to this male call, meaning that either males are coming to compete with the male that's calling or the males are going, I know where the action's at. So they, the male call attracts both males and females. The They did find that females prefer certain call types, and so they honed in on that, but males didn't really care. Any other male calling, they're there. Uh, The other thing that they knew was that toads follow their gut, so they wanted to attract insects. They couldn't display normal white lights that usually bugs flock to because these toads, again, being nocturnal and crepuscular, don't like bright lights. So they played with different types of UV lights, and they found a type of UV light that attracts insects and does not bother the toads. So now they have these traps that involve mating calls of a male cane toad and these UV lights. So there's kind of a smorgasbord inside. And they were able to capture adult breeding age males and females. And if they picked their season wisely, they could do this before they reproduce. So not only could they eradicate uh, the problem via current individuals out in the habitat, but they could actually prevent future generations by getting this all before mating season. Hmm. So... This will hopefully help put maybe a slight dent, um, but, but it's also, billions, yeah, billions it's all, of tra- I mean, that's yeah. a lot of traps. Okay, It is indeed. But the <laughs> other side of this is to use the trapped individuals to help develop other control methods. So that might be genetically engineering disease. What could go wrong? <laughs> or genetically engineering sterility. Yes. So that's another one. Genetically engineered sterility or also genetically engineered toads that are not toxic. So then local Mm -hmm. predators can have at them. So the the That sounds like it would be the easiest. Yeah, I agree. Get rid of those glands for sure. Yeah, there might be another solution. Yeah, because another thing going on right now is that they're trying to train local species Mm -hmm. to avoid toads so they're they're putting like a dummy marine toad out that smells really terrible or tastes terrible or shocks them to try to (laughs) train these populations to avoid marine toads but there's still so many toads what what were you going to say justin target practice (laughs) no which they have done i mean they've they've tried all sorts of things encouraging australians to do violence to these toads Mm -hmm. and, and bounties on them all sorts of ridiculous things um why don't we just take whatever the natural predator was <laughs> and just import a whole yeah. bunch of toads? What could go I, wrong? I, yeah. Uh, the, there's one I, was, I found on, I just Googled at uh, the banded cat eyed snake. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What could go wrong? That's what Australia needs is more snakes. Well, these ones are only mildly venomous, <laughs> but uh, you know, that's a, hey, it worked everywhere else. Why not there? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> mm-hmm. What could go wrong? Uh, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah.
It'd be so interesting to see if they could, um, you know, not, not, maybe not genetically, I don't know, if they could genetically change the female's preferences for certain cane toad songs. Like if there are mm-hmm. some male cane toads that are less poisonous than others, is yeah, there, you know, is there variation in the poison in the poison gland? And can't, could you change, Great question. could you change the selection, the breeding yeah. selection maybe? I don't know. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And mm. the thing that I selfishly think about with this is that in California and along a lot of the West coast of the United States, we have a bullfrog problem, oh, yeah, Eastern species. They're eating turtles. So mm. they're, yeah, bullfrogs, they get even larger than the marine toad and they are eating native uh, rodents, they are eating native birds, and they're eating native turtles. So Do you think they if, eat cane toads? Because we may have just found a You know, that's a great question. I feel like probably not, because they probably are not immune to the poison. Yeah, but oh, yeah. so any way that we can figure this out, especially oh. something based on traps like this, this is not specific to uh, this is something that potentially could be extrapolated to other species. So this is something I think if it works well, we could we could maybe do with with bullfrogs as well. Yeah, well, the one thing we do know about the bullfrogs is that they jumped from bank to bank. That is true. That's right. Yeah. Bullfrogs Hip hop from bank to bank. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's right. Down on the banks of the hanky panky and the drop. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. I have no idea what you two are talking about. <laughs> you small <laughs> children. How do you not know that? How do you I've not know this never song? Heard this? Oh my goodness. Ever. Um, all right, the speaking of hanky panky, where the bullfrogs jump from bank to bank, singing I, this is the hop, first time. Hippity hop, leap off a lily pad, bang, go kerplop. But that's what it was. I, I remembered it. I heard that before. That's Ever. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, yeah. cane toads, bullfrogs, traps. Can we yeah. change them? Can we do something about it? What? Ah, this is driving me batty. What am I going to learn about it? <gasps> Well, speaking of cane toads and South America, one of their actual native predators, a type of bat, the white-throated, round-eared bat, has been shown this week to learn from other species. So they have used auditory-based social learning to identify new food sources from individuals of another bat species. The bats are talking to each other. Hmm. This is crazy. Pew. Cross, so cross species conversations, cross species right. cross conversations. So um, they will roost together in mixed species groups. But in previous studies, we've been sh- we've shown that they're aware that there are different species in the area because when given the option, they choose to sleep near their own species when they're all mixed up together in a lab. So we know for sure that they're not just confusing these different bats for their same brethren. They know there are different species, but they still live together in these caves. And they have been shown now in this new study to learn acoustic cues about unfamiliar prey from both members of their same species and members of another species. They were also able to figure it out on their own, but it took them much longer. So they caught on to things much faster when they were getting vocal cues from these other species. And they say that learning about new prey cues may be more difficult than learning new information about a previously familiar call. And they took advantage of of this by learning from these other species, although it did on average take about three times longer to learn a new cue compared to learning a a cue they had heard before from a new species. So this is, there's not a lot in this study. It's, it's pretty simple. They just showed that they responded to these sounds coming from another species and they were able to identify it as a key a cue that there was food nearby. And this was for uh, a lot of different animals, but including cane toads. And they found that they also learned because one of the species was a little too small to eat cane toads. They learned the difference between the cane toad call and other calls from this other species. So it wasn't just, oh, they're talking. Let me follow them. They actually learned what the call meant. So 
I am kind of of two minds on this study. One, wow, that's really cool. Species are talking to each other. But two, um, maybe duh, though, because these <laughs> animals have been living together for millions of years. Yeah. You think they'd catch on to what other other folks are talking about nearby. I'm not even, surprised. Really. Yeah, like even if they don't know the exact what the exact meaning of a call is, you know, this, the same way we don't. But if you hear a dog barking, you go, oh, is there something going on? Because you think, right. you know, dogs tend to warn people about intruders. Right. You know, is there, you know, you, we, uh, yeah. Cats, How many dogs, animals do we animals. train to respond to sounds? Yes. That's, yeah. That's, it just sounds, it sounds mostly like conditioning to me, especially because they mm -hmm. said that it took a while. So I, it's neat to see the evidence of it happening in the wild, but I'm, yeah, I'm not really surprised and I can't wait for it to come out in more and more species because of course they've done species, they've done studies on this with a lot of different primate species and quote, you know, that, that age old tale of until now we thought only primates were capable of this, blah, 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 blah. but really like, <laughs> Animals are smart. They know how to survive and they know how they're observant. They're observant to the world around them. And if other animals around them are going to give them a clue to when food is available, they're going to pick up on it. Can, I, can I get your rendition one more time of the casual nature journalist? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, until now, primates were thought to be the only animals that had language. Oh, you know. <laughs> Uh, giraffes don't make sounds you know <laughs> you know <laughs> they have vocal cords but i mean i'm sure they're for nothing at all <laughs> there we go all right well done very nicely done so bats i mean these are you know mammals we've got the bats have great hearing this does yeah not surprising and i was gonna bring up birds Birds fly in flocks of multiple species very mm -hmm. often. Uh, they probably pick up on each, each other's songs and calls and cues all the time, um, especially when predators are involved. And, um, and then additionally, there are even squirrels and some birds have anti-predator calls mm -hmm. that they yep. use, that they basically yell at a predator in the face. Mm. Leave me alone! You know, it's like the animal version of uh, self-defense training, right? Stop it! And they yell, they yell at the other animal. And so predators understand that. So this is yet another, I, I would say this is yet another very interesting yeah. example. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, I, absolutely. I, I would, I would ex yeah, and I would also agree with you. Yeah, I would expect this to be something that happens constantly in like a very densely compact area, like a jungle with, you got some birds and you got some frog sounds and you got some all these different creatures living together making different sounds it would be useful to know their alert sound right it would be <laughs> helpful to know if the if the birds up in the canopy are all shrieking danger because there's a <laughs> wandering around you'd probably like to be informed about that too yeah, um absolutely and i'm do you see this at the zoo ever like if one like if the yeah. primates are going nuts, the, do the other animals kind of react to it a little bit? Do they? they like, oh, some what's... animals will kind of compete with their sounds. It, mm. yeah, it kind of depends. It depends on a lot of things. Um, but it's it's mo definitely I hear it most with the primates because it's kind of somebody starts and then it's kind of this cascading effect through the primate center. Yeah. Everybody's starting to call out, uh, but it's it's hard because they don't have the visual cues a lot of the time mm -hmm. and i think that because they live to the same next to the same species for so long they might get kind of desensitized to hearing certain things like oh it's just the siamangs again go back to sleep you know <laughs> yeah, no, yeah it's that it's that salient information what is the call the cue that actually has personal relevance you know yeah. and we listen to you know people's conversations on the streets there are sounds all over the place but you know you don't really cue into something and start listening mm -hmm. until it there's you, you pick up on something that's personally important right. to you right. somebody walking yeah, by the, the thing like, that... oh, i saw this great science documentary I'm like, 
Yeah. Yeah. So for example, something that, that does sometimes get the animals in the zoo talking more than normal is we, we allow service animals in the, in the zoo. Occasionally, sometimes um, people abuse that ability and they will say they have service animals when maybe perhaps they do not. And so they will bring in a dog that then starts barking at one of the exhibits. And that will usually cause some problems where, you know, some animals will start vocalizing in a way that they don't often. Mm -hmm. Those people are always escorted out pretty much right away. But that's definitely something that you see where the, they're going, oh, that's a very unfamiliar sound from a weird looking thing ah. <laughs> no thank you <laughs> go away yeah. not interested yeah that's fascinating yeah when people bring their service chimpanzees it's got to be quite enough oh no thank you uh we did once have a service pig come to the zoo <laughs> i thought oh. was an odd choice yeah and we had a service cockatoo come to the zoo that was that was an interesting one we just require that they are in some way tethered so that they don't fly off into uh, the lion exhibit or something. But. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. A service cockatoo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What could a cockatoo do? So the, the only Who animals knows? that, well, the animal I most frequently see interacting with uh, animals in the zoo are squirrels. Mm -hmm. yes. They go in and out of the exhibits. They're eating like the, the cockatoo's food and the cockatoo's, you know, that. Yeah. Sometimes if the squirrels get a little too close to the chimpanzees, they become a fuzzy toy. Oh Ooh, no. dear. Yeah. <laughs> Squirrel. We, I mean, call that it's flying through the air. Yeah. Oh gosh. That's, that's good old natural selection. That is. <laughs> oh dear. Oh dear. Oh dear. And right now I'm going to naturally select us to take a quick break. This is This Week in Science, and we will be back with more sciencey goodness after this break. There is lots of plastic coming ahead and much more. Stay tuned. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to Twist right now. Thank you for being a part of our audience and joining us every week to learn about the universe that we exist within and to find out more and more and more as we gather more knowledge through this pursuit of science. We love being here with you. Now, those of you who are joining us every week, thank you for subscribing. And for those of you who are interested in subscribing to This Week in Science, there are multiple ways you can do it. But the easiest is to head right on over to twist.org. There's a big orange subscribe button right on the main page. You click on that button, it'll give you a few options. You can subscribe to us through Google Play, through iTunes, or on YouTube if you like the video version. But subscribing will bring us to your inbox or to your device on a weekly basis. Every time we publish a show, it will join you where you are, just like a magazine, you know? It's the way it works. These digital subscriptions, it's pretty fun stuff. So you don't necessarily have to remember to come find us. It will we'll come find you, but you have to subscribe. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and join us. Be a part of the audience on a weekly basis. If you would like to also help keep this show going on a weekly basis, you, the listener, the viewer, you are our supporter as well. So to help us out, please donate or buy some merchandise. That's right. So donations, click on the yellow donate button on the side of the main page, or you can click on any recent episode Scroll on down through those show notes and find some pink buttons at the bottom of the page. Now, all of these buttons I'm telling you about will allow you to donate through PayPal. So if you are if you use PayPal, this will make it a nice, easy, either recurring or one-time contribution 
to the ongoing costs that are a part of making this show possible. If you're interested also, we have a community at Patreon. So Patreon is a crowdfunding site for content producers like us. And so you can head over to Patreon by clicking on the link on our main page or going directly to patreon.com slash This Week in Science and clicking on the Become a Patron button. Become a patron at a level of your choice. $1, $5, $10, $200 a month. You'll get charged once a month and it will help Keep the show going. Keep us, uh, keep us in the red, right? Or in the black? I don't want to be in the red. I want, I want to make my budget. And you are how I am able to do this. You are how we are able to do this, to be able to bring the show to you week after week after week. So either click on those Patreon, the PayPal links on our website, or head over to Patreon and. Uh, basically subscribe to helping sponsor this show on a on a weekly monthly basis you can also click on the zazzle store link on our twist.org page twist.org uh, zazzle store will take you to where all of our products are nice things with the twist logo that you can wear proudly and share twist people will be like what's twist what's that all about you lift up your nice phone and you got it on your phone case and people go oh what's twist you send a letter with a stamp on it that says twist and people go wow what's twist what's that then you can tell them about us and you can tell them to head to twist.org where they can subscribe See, it all comes full circle. You can help promote twists. You can help us meet our needs by buying our merchandise and uh, where a portion of the proceeds comes right back to us. And also, you will also help bring new people to us so that we can grow our audience and grow our subscriber base. And just, we, we want to be bigger. We want to grow and we love doing it with you. So thank you so much, all of you who have joined us here, who join us every week. If you are also, if you're not able to uh, to help financially by donating or by buying any of our, any of our merchandise, share us on social media. Tell your friends around the coffee, uh, the coffee cooler. No, the coffee pot, the water cooler. Tell people you know about Twist. Let them know that we are available and we are here and we want to help them learn about science and learn about the world around them just the way that we are helping you enjoy the world around you. Thank you for joining us every week. We really appreciate your support in all these different ways. We couldn't do this without you. Leaves me slightly queasy deep down in the abdomen and Convinced that the lives that they lead need adjusting They drive to the bookstore and blindly start trusting the Miracles and cures all laid down in black ink Never even bothering to stop and think The only and we're back with more this week in science. Yes, we are. We are here. We've got some more science coming your way. But first, we have this week in what has science done for me lately? Hot mic. Hot mic. He's broken. <laughs> He's got a hot mic. Rebooter. <laughs> Uh, all right. So our letter today is not like all of our other letters. Uh, and Paul and our uh, the person who writes in, Paul says, I hope that you can use this or if it's too hard, at least use it as inspiration. Paul writes in, he says, hi, Dr. Kiki. So how to start? Well, I listen to these segments, which are often about health issues. And while I'm really happy for the people who are helped, I also find them a bit depressing because they ignore the, let's say, less good health parts of health science. I've got a health problem that's been going on for nearly 10 years. It took me eight years to find a doctor who would do more than say, go away. And even now, while my current doctor has had a pretty good go at trying to figure out what's going on, they still don't know, and so there's no solution. However, that's not the problem. I accept that we won't always be able to get answers. But the problem is, is the lack of care. All the doctors that I've seen show no signs of caring about me or how the lack of answers affects me. And for that, I blame science. Doctors have uh -huh. become blinded by all the good stuff they can do with the consequence that when they can't provide a solution, 
they don't know how to provide or don't see the need to provide a caring human touch. All their science, which they worship, just look at the way that they react to any alternative health system, has insulated them from human needs and wiped out their humanity. Ah! It's not just in treatment that this is a problem. Chronic fatigue isn't my problem, but the way that people with it have been treated by the research community illustrates the problem. Initially, there was Simon Wesley, who said it was all in people's heads, and because he was such a prominent figure, everyone in the science community fell into line, presumably without thinking. Oh. Even now, when the all-in-the-head explanation has been debunked, he's still lauded by the science community. More recently, we've had the PACE trial where the authors fought tooth and nail against releasing their data. And who did the science community back? Well, I don't think that it was the patients. Where is the care in any of this? So what has science done for me lately? I think that it's taken the care out of healthcare, and I don't think that's a good thing. And as he said, if this is too hard, at least use it as in inspiration to recognize the damage that sci science sometimes does. Uh, what? Okay, Thanks for so, writing, Paul. I thought Paul, that, that I is, thought you wrote, and it's all it's good for us to have a conversation point. Yeah. Yeah. So here it is. Here it is. <laughs> so first of all, doctors are not scientists. They're mechanics. They're people <laughs> mechanics. That's all they are. That's it's it's not like they're doing research into or looking for new ways to do things. That's not what they've been trained to do. It's not what their expectation is when they go in. It's not their profession. Okay. Just like when you take a car into uh, the shop. There's somebody who knows how to turn the wrench and where to put the torque and then to change the part out and put the other part back in, whatever it is. That's what a doctor does. Okay. They, I, and, and the, the, and there's a sort of a wishfulness, I think, in what you have stated here about wanting alternative remedies to work. That does not make them work. <laughs> Right? No, but there is, but there, I, 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 I see what he's come, where he's coming. It doesn't make alternative therapies work. There is a reticence, or has been a reticence historically, for science to approach some alternative therapies and to study them. I think that's changed over the last few decades, and that more research is happening. But still, there's a difficulty. I had a conversation like a week ago about the difficulty in actually coming up with proper controls for some of these medical procedures. So how do you do a control group properly for um, acupuncture? You know, right. you're, getting, you're getting stuck with needles or you're not getting stuck with needles. Right. right? Yeah, well, so, but, uh, there's also then you look at like how many people have been slathering on, um, you know, lavender or tea tree oil infused things onto their bodies. And it turns out those are endocrine disruptors. <laughs> Lavender is a synthetic estrogen. I mean, and it turns out that we have receptors for these volatile um, odor compounds in our skin so that we actually, our skin and our physiology can actually respond. We don't exactly know how yet to um, odorants, yeah. which is so fascinating. But I think what he's getting at here also is that there is a very art I mean, and it's not necessarily doctors. It's not necessarily, it m might be the fault of science in some way or our, um, our interpretation of scientific results and how we put them into practice within the medical practice. And his, his comment here that there is a, a big side of it that is missing within the medical practice, which is that human caring touch, which is just mm -hmm. humanity. And um, if, you know, there is a lot of nurses are fantastic and come in and are very caring, but you know, the doctor comes through and it's check the checkboard and it's very, well, and it varies from like. doctor to doctor too. But I think that, I think that it, the, the point that I see kind of shining through this that I would agree with is that part of caring for a human is also caring for the brain. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so if we're not going to make some form of therapy or counseling or some outlet to be able to speak to a person, a standard um, option for every human, then people end up looking for that in their doctor, which is a covered option for most humans. So right. I think that's kind of the other side of this is that 
we're very focused on the treatment of our physical body and we're not as focused on the treatment of our brain and our emotional system and our chemical system sometimes as we should be. And so that actually might have a lot to do with these sorts of problems. I think that there's other experts in that. Like, I mean, sure. I, I, again, yeah. I think the doctor is a mechanic. You're the, the, the patient in fact can be in the way of them doing their job. <laughs> sure. But, but what I mean is that, is that people don't feel like those specialists are available to them quite at the same breadth that, that physicians and, are. Right. That an emergency room doctor is. Mm -hmm. And so example. people look yeah. there for something that they should be looking elsewhere for potentially as well. Yeah. And loquacious one in the chat room is saying that this, that this is a huge issue and also hidden disabilities are mostly ignored. And there are many things that become ignored in the either in the scientific investigations uh, because of lack of funding, because of, you know, we have um, orphan diseases or that don't get treatments because or because they're such rare disease, you know, these genetic disorders that only affect a very small number of people. So there are, there's some right. very interesting yeah, right. aspects to this that I think his letter brings up. Um, and yeah, I think you're right, Justin, that doctors are mechanics, but then it's that interpretation. What science gets studied? How is that science then interpreted and applied? Right. Well, and it's there's also the element of how what they're doing is being explained to the person it's being done to, yeah. which is a part that I personally have struggled with in the past is, okay, you have to explain why you're doing what you're doing to me. Because some people maybe don't want to hear that, but some people do. And I'm somebody that wants to know exactly step by step about my health care. And this is why I got into an argument with my dentist because they explained it to me. And I was like, that's I don't want to know. <laughs> no, 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 it wasn't. I don't want to know. It's like, Again, you cannot scare me with the word bacteria. That's just yeah. not going to like be sufficient of an answer to anything. What I was going to say is, I think I don't think you should blame science for this any way, shape, or form. Uh, but there is the the issue. I think if you're talking about um, uh, or the orphan ailments or the mystery mystery ailments that that aren't uh, that haven't arisen enough in our giant population for there to be focused research, discovery, and treatment for. It's really you've got to look at funding for science um, in into these things. So you got to look at your politicians. Are your politicians funding science? Are they talking about science? Is this something that's uh, that's precedent for them? Because this the doctor who is the mechanic can't do anything without the troubleshooter guide. And if it's never been looked at, or if the study, you know, the other thing is that study there may be fifty scientists out there right now who've seen indications of your condition and would want to pursue research. But if they don't get grants, if they don't get funded, they can't do their work to come up with that. So um, scientists actually, for a large part, also I think are not necessarily caring individuals, but they are curious individuals. And if there's a problem or a mystery out there, I guarantee you there's scientists who will want to work on it if for no other reason than to satisfy their curiosity and how they would approach the problem. So even in the uncaring science view of the world, scientists are curious and they'll work on any problem and try to come to any solution. And, 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 and they just need funding. Are people. And scientists are people too. And they actually do care quite a lot and they want to help. And um, yeah, that curiosity drives so much. And I think, uh, I think part of this feeling that scientists or doctors have become separated from humanity that i that is a, a misunderstanding that need a myth even that needs to be repaired because scientists are people too yeah um, but i do think there's a separation between scientists and no people. i am a caring I, person no no i don't mean that you're not caring i just think you know Typically, I just feel like scientists are better people. Well, okay. Well, everyone out there, I know you probably have opinions on this as well. I'd love to hear from you. So uh, we need you to write in. Let us know what you think about this topic. Let us know what you think about what Paul had to say. Let us know also what science has done for you lately. Good? Bad? 
let us know what science has done for you. We want to know all the ways that science affects people in their daily lives. Write in. You can send a message to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash This Week in Science, or you can email me directly at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. We're going to keep doing this segment. Paul, thank you for that uh, interesting, maybe a little controversial, yet thought-provoking commentary. I appreciate that. All right. Now, Justin, Uh-oh. what's up with Texas? Is it Texas? <laughs> Sinkhole state. Sinkhole? Why? Um, well, uh, pretty directly because they've been, tur- they turned that whole state into a pin cushion, uh, extracting oil for many, many decades mm-hmm. is kind of what this will come down to. Uh, but this is, uh, this is, where is this? Southern Mes- Southern Methodist University out of Dallas, uh, previously did a report on rapid rate at which sinkholes are expanding and new ones are forming. In the past, now they've uh, they have a discovery here that on a large portion of Texas uh, is is sinking. Radar satellite images show significant movement of ground across a four thousand square mile area. One of the places, based on the radar data, shows that it has sunk more than forty inches in the past two and a half years 40 <laughs> i was thinking you'd say like oh in the last few decades right no two and a half years it's moved 40 inches down now we've talked about we were talking about the the, the story of san fran lantis how san francisco is slowly sinking into the bay um but it wasn't by this much <laughs> this is pretty significant for some areas to be doing this much sinking and it's not and, and in that 4,000 square mile area where they saw significant movement of the ground is in the 4,000 square mile patch that they had data on. <laughs> okay. That, that doesn't mean it's only happening in this 4,000 square mile, which is a large area. Not that it's just happening in this area, but that's just the radar data that they had to date when they, when they did this study. Uh, they, they're, Analysis is using medium resolution, 15 to 65 feet radar imagery taken between November 2014 and April of 2017. This is, uh, they say that the ground movement could actually be much, much bigger just because they had that one little picture of this one little area. It doesn't mean everything, but they did sort of target this area because there's a lot of oil fields too. So it might be a good, uh, a, a little bit more movement than you could find elsewhere. They also found... Uh, some places where the, the the ground was rising up, I guess they do a pressurizing for the for the fracking uh, or uh, first. No, I'm sorry. CO2 injection in wells to to get the, the oil to bubble out of the rocks a little better. Mm, I guess. Great carbonated pressure. oil. Eh? <laughs> and and when they when it depressurizes, I guess the ground moves up. It expands a little bit. You know, some places you could see an inch of rise in the land. Most significant sub- subsistence, that's the sinking, is a half mile east uh, of Wink. Wink is apparently a town in <laughs> Texas or somewhere. And Wink, Texas. Uh, Blink and it's gone? Is that what you're going to say? <laughs> it, that, that one, is, uh, which has sunk more than 15.5 inches a year. Wow. I think that is uh, mostly likely due to abandoned wells uh, that have water seeping into them and dissolving layers of salts. And they've also got like limestone and other kind of stuff under there that may actually just be actual rock structures that was holding up the ground is dissolving away. This is something I think I don't know a lot about, but what happens when there is a sinkhole progressing this quickly, if you have, for example, a house in Wink, Texas. Okay, so first of all, I think there's probably 20 people that live in Wink, Texas, so who cares? No. (laughs) (laughs) If I'm one of those 20 people. Kind of remote, yeah. Right. What happens Um, to my house? So so it's not just, okay, so think about the house. Yeah, if your house happens to be there, your house settles a little funny, cracks show up in the wall, Uh that door doesn't close all of a sudden. Um, Over time, then maybe your foundation is a little, uh, it needs to be reinforced, but now think that there's a railroad track running through this, this particular area. 
Mm -hmm. That railroad track now with a 15 inch sinking area and some maybe can't actually handle the speeds at which that train normally runs. Maybe all of a sudden the 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 track has to get shut down because of its and then you've mm -hmm. got Freeways, oil pipelines. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, pipelines running through an area. Well, now that oil, that, that land has moved six inches. How much stress is now on different portions of that pipeline further away? There's junctures. Now there's, there's potentials for cracks. There. So it's, it's a huge, oh, and if there's a levee. Oh, on, right. A river. A if there's a dam somebody built for a reservoir. That like, old chestnut. Yeah, I mean, we kind of built upon the earth as though it would stay where it is. <laughs> right? like, and then we dug out underneath all the custard. We, yeah. yeah. I mean, we've seen it in San Francisco um, from water extraction. We've seen it in the Central Valley from water extraction. It's It's been an issue for a lot of farmland in, in, here in California. Uh, but there, yeah, the, all this oil that's been, that's been pulled out is not necessarily just the, the vacuum of where the oil was, but this additional problem of now water gets into there and starts to become a solvent for the materials under there. So, yeah, um, one of those little old things that you uh, mm -hmm. might not have thought could be a problem. But yeah, Texas is sinking. Yikes. Also, um, Bleak in the chat room has told us all that the population of Wink is... 1,046. I was off by 1,000. Yeah. You're off by 1,026. <laughs> oh, 1,026. Yeah. Sorry. Let's keep it yeah. accurate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So up there with the top sinking cities in the world. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah so also, uh, New Mexico will have a, uh, a pool out back now. Yeah. It's also, this also has come with uh, increased seismic activity, too. I guess a lot of these wells are uh, about a half a mile down which doesn't seem like that would be deep enough to like, I don't know. I just assume like earthquakes come from someplace much further down. Uh, but I guess, you know, you get, you get the, the ground moving in ways it didn't before. That's, that's, a, it's enough to, to create earthquakes. Yep. Yeah. And now we've got, we've got fracking and, uh, and other effects that may just be increasing it more. Oh, people. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, people changing Goodbye. the environment. We are, we are absolutely the, uh, the beavers. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Beavers are actually good. They're they good. Right. No. Wetlands <laughs> that allows more birds to be in an area. We are the cane toads. If you will. <laughs> no, yeah. I don't want to be a cane toad. We are the, oh, we are absolutely the cane. Yeah, I think we are. Earth. Cause nothing so, can eat us. <laughs> so, so far tonight. I am an emotionless cane toad. Great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving on from that. Oh dear. We the stuff we love. Plastics, plastics mm. everywhere. And really truly not a drop to drink. Well, according to a new study that is not peer reviewed. By uh -oh. the way. Alarm. So, alarm. Alarm. No, no, it's not an alarm. Well, it's just mess. It, it's not peer reviewed. And so we, uh, there's a little pause that we should take before jumping at these results. But the researchers involved in this are, uh, uh, have done a lot of work in plastics and are well known in this. But the research here was conducted on behalf of a US nonprofit journalism organization called Orb Media. Now, Orb Media hired a research team to test bottled water. For microplastic contents. The team, uh, led by Professor Sherry Mason, who works out of the State University of New York, SUNY, was, uh, they tested 259 bottles of water purchased in nine countries. A lot of the brands are sold internationally, but uh, the water source, manufacturing, bottling process, even for the same brand, can be totally different depending on which country you're dealing with, right? The 11 brands that they tested involved Nestle Pure Life, Aquafina, Dasani, Evian, Evian, Evian? Evian. 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 San Pellegrino, and Gerolsteiner. 
as oh. well as other brands across Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Americas. They found 93% of all bottles tested contained microplastics of some kind or another. That includes poly polypropylene, polystyrene, nylon, and PET or polyethylene terphthalate. Okay, I have a question but before we get any further. Yes. How do we know that these microplastics are not from the plastic bottles themselves? Exactly. So some of this could be, but uh, so far the levels at which they found these plastics, uh, they, they did not match just okay. the plastic from the bottle. Um, okay. And they found plastic particles in this microplastic particle range, a global average of 10.4 plastic particles per liter. And uh, they were confirmed as plastic using an industry standard infrared microscope. They found a greater number of even smaller particles, smaller than 100 microns or so, that are likely plastic, but because they're so small, they couldn't actually identify them as plastic specifically. And there were many more of these teeny, teeny, tiny uh, particles that uh, there was a 314.6 per liter. The, the water companies that responded to comment on, uh, on this study said that the levels of the plastics that were found in this study were much higher than the levels that they had found in testing their own water. So, hmm. so they're guilty. So the, <laughs> like, there is there is no the question is right now we don't know what level of microplastics are healthy or unhealthy. All we right. know is that they're increasing in quantity mm -hmm. in the waters of the world and right. they are being found. And this study points to them being found at higher levels in plastic bottled water than in tap drinking water. Well, we know that bottled water is not filtered to the same standards as tap water. We right. know that. Often. often. So often. in most Depends cases... Yeah, but in most cases, the tap water is better filtered than the bottle. So I'm not that surprised to hear that. But I think that, I think it's weird that they would go out of their way to say that that's not the testing results that they got. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Unless, Jackson, we're, Mr. Jackson, we're accusing you. Uh, we we think you stole a million dollars from the bank. <laughs> it was it wasn't nearly that much. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Well, that's what, that's what I mean. Is is it seems like a weird thing for them to jump to if it's mm -hmm. not at least somehow based in truth. Right. Yeah, so these microplastics, I guess, are found at certain levels. Uh, Garol Steiner said its tests showed a significantly lower quantity of microplastics per liter in its product products. And they say, we still cannot under can't understand how the study reached the conclusions it's, it did. The research results the don't correspond to internal analyses that we conduct on a regular basis. And uh, Danon, the company behind Evian and other brands, said it, it's not in a position to comment on this story as the testing methodology that's used is unclear and there's still limited data on the topic and conclusions differ dramatically from one study to another. So this is a, an open question and that's why I mentioned early in this that this is not a peer-reviewed study and I think the methodology that's used by the researchers is very important because if that methodology is clear and understood then you can go back to the bottling companies and say what mm -hmm. what are you doing how yeah, are you testing your how, what's your methodology how do these compare why is our number higher yeah. but the fact that there is a defined number uh, or uh, undefined number so i guess uh out there um it's not on the label i don't i didn't know i was drinking microplastics in my plastic bottled water i had well, no I idea think I, I think we are at the point I'm, now. I'm a lot more buoyant Cheers. than I used to. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you're more buoyant. You probably weigh a little bit more than you did. Yeah, yeah, you get the full of Yeah, it's. But I think that it, we're at the point now where we just have to assume that any water has microplastics in it because we everything we do is putting putting microplastics somehow in in the water column, whether it be spraying our crops with pesticides or um, washing our clothes 
it's all putting microplastics into the water table. So it's, it's just part of life on earth now is pla we plasticified the earth. Yes. And speaking of these unknown Schnock, Schnock health... is blaming the pipettes. It's all scientists. <laughs> oh, well. The pipettes. <laughs> yeah. The Schnago. Uh, so along the health con consequences of plastics in our environment, a new study has come out of the lab of Deborah Karas, Karash, a neuroscientist at the University of Calgary, and uh, a postdoctoral fellow in her lab named Dino Nissan, uh, presented research recently. This also at the is at the Endocrine Society in meeting in Chicago. This also has not yet been published, so it's pre-publication and peer review. But the data that he released of a study of pregnant mice exposed to bisphenol A, BPA, while they were pregnant, they found that uh, that that the mice that were exposed gave birth to young mice with neuron with neuronal developmental neuronal issues that had strange behaviors later in life and that even when they were fed low levels of the chemical 10 to 20 times below the recommended daily intake for humans there was significant acceleration to early neuron development BPA exposure also increased number, size, and rate of proliferation of neurons in the young mice brains, but also reduced their self, their ability to self-renew or what's called their stemness, and that pushed them toward a more differentiated state sooner, and that that lead that led to changes in the way that they behaved as older mice and as adults. Um, so developmental effects of very low levels. And the big thing here for BPA is that it's not following the usual dose response curve of many chemicals or many hormone affecting chemicals in the environment where you have low levels that don't really affect. And then there's some threshold level that tips off a physiological response. And then you have responsiveness of the body after that point. What There's a bimodal response to BPA in this study. So low levels of BPA affect development of the neurons. Nothing really happens in the mid range, according to this research. And then again, at the high levels of BPA exposure, there again is a, a change in development and in behavior and yeah. aspects of, neuro of, of the neurons and of the brain. So it's this question of as the research said, the field is really moving towards studying BPAs at these low doses, but I think we need an overwhelming amount of evidence to be able to convince a regulatory body that we really need to look at this. Well, it would be kind of a win-win if you could get rid of a lot of the BPAs yeah. because you'd be getting rid of a lot of single-use plastic. Yep. So, I'm all for it. Test away. I'm all for it. Let's see if we can get there. Let's get rid of the plastics in our environment. Oh, we can't. It's all in the microplastics. Uh, you can always stop from making more. <laughs> let's just, <laughs> let's be satisfied with the level of microplastics we have now, whatever they are, and say, <laughs> maybe that's enough. We're just swimming in it. I like swimming in it. Yeah. But let's let's keep it to the point where we have trouble figuring out how to detect it as opposed to when our, our water is mush. Ooh, microplastic mush. That sounds fantastic. Moving on from terrible, terrible news about our environment and plastics. Justin, what do you got? Oh, uh, is it that time again where I talk about a story and I was, uh, let's go with. Talk about <laughs> science. Uh, so this is uh this is sciencey. This is uh 1812. Governor of Massachusetts Elbridge Jerry approved a long, narrow, winding voting district for the state senate that curved and carved, twisted and turned. Ultimately, ended up with a district that looked very much like a salamander with a long neck. So much so that a newspaper labeled the district the gerrymander. 206 years later, uh, arguments over political map making continue. Part of why this difficult, uh, this issue is sort of difficult to address, uh, is actually not too difficult to understand because regardless of where it takes place or who's benefiting from it, 
there's always a political party that lacks the power to be in charge of gerrymandering. And so they complain about it. And then at some right. point, maybe they, they become uh, empowered, get voted in, and then it's not such a big deal to them anymore. <laughs> they don't talk about it. They're it. So nobody ever fixes this. Right? Uh, a University of Vermont mathematician, Greg Warrington, has developed a tool to identify gerrymandered districts. He's calling it the declination. <laughs> There's no single standard of what exactly gerrymandering is. There's no one way to test for it. But our measure, he says, is better in a lot of ways than the other approaches now being used. Pretty much the other approach being used right now is how weird does it look? That's how you kind of determine what gerrymandering is in a lot of cases. Uh, but he points out a lot of weird looking districts are looking weird because they're the lay of the land is just weird, right? Like you might have farmland in between, or it might be that there was this one group that was totally underserved and part of a, you know, because, because where they happen to be on the map. And so sometimes it's not a bad thing, but he went through and he did, uh, went way back in the way back machine and looked at past elections and these sorts of things. Uh, went back since uh, 1972. So he found that the most extreme gerrymandering favored favoring Republicans was in a 1980 election in Virginia. Uh, and there was a Texas election in 1976, which was the most gerrymandered for Democrats. Right. So. Uh, more recent years, 2012 to 2016, his analysis shows Pennsylvania, Ohio, North Carolina strongly gerrymandered for Republicans, while Maryland and California voting districts have strongly tipped in favor of Democrats. Again, I kind of think it may happen to be who's the governor, who's the party in charge, and that's when these things sort of change. So, but he kind of lays out his his system is designed on finding the wasted votes. Uh, so if you want to gerrymander an election, you actually don't just want all of the, you don't want all of the Blairsians in your district versus the Kikians in the other district. You don't want that. You don't, if you're Blair, you want the Blairsians. This is who, these are your people, right? These are the ones most likely to vote for you. What you actually want is to have a district that's got 55% Blairsians <laughs> and 45% Kikians. Because that way you've got a big part of her population that's wasting their vote, right? Um, and, but in her, and you created a district for her that's almost entirely Kikians. It was going to go for her anyway, but you put 70% of likely Kiki voters over there, right? So you're going to win your election and she's going to win her election over in this other area, but you've designed it so that you can grab a whole bunch of the others' territory. Anyway, so this is what, this is what his... His computer pro his his uh, algorithm looks for it looks for basic the biases of when you've created one system into another that wastes more of the other person's votes mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. makes more of their voters whether they went there and voted or not doesn't really matter it was so heavily going to be a a kiki district that um, you know, if even with a, a low voter. So it's sort of an interesting way of looking at this and addressing this because I guess where the Supreme Court's now weighing in on these sorts of things, but we still don't have a way of saying this is that isn't. How do you how do you try to figure out a politically charged issue with only politicians looking at it? It's again 206 years and we've done nothing but do more of this. So um, a third party science based analysis of what is and what isn't gerrymandering may be something that uh, that if uh, that if he has his way, he's even talking about it is creating a standard that uh, identifies these sorts of districts throughout the nation. Well, that would I guess the first step is discovering the supremely gerrymandered areas and then figuring out how to fix them, how to make things more fair overall. I mean, the, uh, the interesting thing like, here, like, I don't know, like right now it's like, okay, we have two parties basically, but that, mm -hmm. you know, the independents and the green party and these other parties that are such a small percentage of the population, they don't really have a say when it comes to, uh, to, to the voting and to what's going to happen in various districts. So I, yeah. you know, well, and it also focuses it needs to evolve 
over time is what I'm thinking. Yeah. To allow I, for more groups. I think people so quickly forget about everything that people vote for other than president. <laughs> and the fact that the these issues often impact much more local things going yeah. on that, that much people more strongly. don't pay as much attention to. People don't vote as much in those elections. And so I think that might be another reason that it kind of gets pushed at, off onto the periphery so often is that but it's, then not, you, yeah, it's not yeah because election yeah it's, a, it's a once every four years kind of kind of thought process but in reality every two years and even more often you've got these local state and local elections that are going to affect the makeup of school boards that are going to affect the makeup of uh local governmental bodies that are going to have say over um over all sorts of local standards and how money is spent and how uh, and how how laws are enacted and regulated in those local areas and yeah that's the big the local state and local that's that's big also but it's never going to be fair because um yeah. Vermont's senate delegation is the same number of seats as California it's not by population i mean like we they're they're sending congress people yeah, it's it's just an element of the issues that could be addressed for yeah. sure, but it's still an important element. Yeah, um, but but yeah, when you when you when you start to then carve out, you know, a a political advantage, which it, when you might be a have the minority of the voters, but you can carve out a majority of the seats. It's yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's equity. Ah, fairness. These are such, they're totally meaningless words. Just that sounds meaningless. like democracy. You How and silly. your meaningless Ugh. words. Meaningless words. You know who had lots of meaningful words? Who? Stephen Hawking. Oh. He did. And did you know that before he died, he submitted a paper <laughs> with another author, Thomas Hertog. Oh my and goodness, of course he did. That's amazing. It, it's in press right now. It's in review. So he's obviously, Hawking is obviously not going to be making any changes to the paper. Hertog will probably be the corresponding author from this point forward. But uh, the news came out that this this paper is available as a preprint. So it hasn't uh, gone through peer review. It's on the archive. And uh, this paper a lot of people have been making these claims about oh it predicts the end of the universe and it's going to help us pre find multiverses and all this kind of stuff but this was hawking and this is a very uh early idea that the that hawking and hertog were writing about and so what the media has been putting out there or what they did put out there in the large part immediately following his his death last week. Um, it's was totally not, correct. It, oh. No, misrepresented <laughs> his words entirely. And it was yeah. probably uh, actually misunderstood, misunderstandings of language. So uh, this paper is called A Smooth Exit from Eternal Inflation. Ah, mm-hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. and so is our, this is the idea, you know, after the Big Bang, we're... There's inflation and is the universe expanding? Is this internal inflation? What's happening? Is our universe going to expand and cool and what's going on? And it has the idea of a multiverse, which is a simultaneous existence of multiple universes kind of side by side and next to each other, uh, but not touching each other. And, uh, but the idea that they work on, which is called eternal inflation, the inflation continues forever in some most places, but sometimes it stops. And when the inflation stops, universes form like our own and others in other places. And this is a repeating process that would never end. And these universes, the laws of physics all look like different, look different, meaning constants that we find here in our own universe are not going to exist necessarily in the same way in another universe as part of the multiverse. Uh, researcher Will Kinney said in an article that you can find on discovermagazine.com, uh, 
Com says eternal inflation creates an infinite number of patch universes, little bubble universes all over the place with this inflating space between them. But there's a problem here and there's the probability that our universe is the way it is, right? And how do you calculate that probability when uh, you're using infinity as part of that calculation? And so they in the paper are trying to put forward this method to define boundaries on universes that might exist, which could lead us in the direction of detecting other universes in a multiverse, if that is in fact what we exist within. But it's a very preliminary mathematical investigation of this idea, and in no way actually is giving us experiments to do to find other universes. That's not what they do at all. So if the media told you that and you got that idea, mm. Hawking did not publish that. <laughs> And then uh, beyond that, even the idea of the end of the universe, and then there's like this, um, the, the, the idea of these membranes, and really the brain is like, or the, they talk about a brain in the work, and this brain is this idea of a membrane, basically the membrane that bounds our universe and separates us from these other universes, and there's there's no prediction of the end of the universe in this paper. Good. Dodged Even if there again. was, it would be quite a ways from now. <laughs> if by quite a ways, you mean Thursday after next. Yeah, yeah. Dun, 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 dun. It's like I was teaching a class talking about whether we could use up the sun, talking about solar panels. <laughs> and of course, some smart alecky child went yeah eventually the sun's gonna go away and i was like sure. all right that's a right. long time from now you don't have to worry about that that'll be after your lifetime yeah after millions of lifetimes in fact get out of here get out of here <laughs> Yeah, so this is really, it's wonderful to know that Hawking was still working on interesting ideas and using his wonderful brain even just weeks before his death and that that, that his science will still be with us and will be con continuing for his, he will be stimulating investigations for some time to come, nice. certainly. Uh, doing science from beyond the grave. That's right. And then I wanted to comment very briefly. Also, I reported at the very end of the show last week on the astronaut research, the DNA, and I parroted the statement from the NASA press release that said 7% of the DNA of the twins is different. That's what it said. And I, I parroted it. And I just want to clarify mm. that, yes, the telomeres, the caps at the ends of the chromosomes, they were different. So they were longer in Scott, who was in space, and shorter in Mark, who was still here on the planet. So that's an interesting question of what is going on with the telomeres as a result of microgravity and blah, blah, blah. So we talked about that, and that mm -hmm. that's totally fine. But this whole 7% of the DNA being, it's not the DNA, it's the genetic expression. So it's mm. the epigenome that would have been changed, even though there, yes, were probably lots of mutations due to cosmic radiation and various other causes, but those point mutations were not necessarily enough to be that 7% number. The yeah, difference that would be between, a lot. <laughs> that would be a lot of point yeah. mutations but it's the epigenetic changes that led to a 7% difference in genetic expression. Mm -hmm. So how the genes were actually being turned into proteins and little bits so, of RNA. So this doesn't then explain why he now has a tail. <laughs> he doesn't have a tail. So yeah. that, I was like, oh, it's because the genes are different, but no, that's not. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So anyway, I just wanted to make, I wanted to clarify that because I don't think I made that clear last week. Because I was trying to just get it in at the end of the show and not dig into the details too much, but yes, so still I just very cool, very, very neat. cool. Yes, yeah. still very cool, very interesting, but not. Oh my 
my goodness, space causes genetic mutations on such a large scale. Oh, what's that voice? Oh, my God. We should do lunch. That's Marvin the Martian. <laughs> ah, that was my Marvin the Martian. That's right. Um, does anyone need some new hair dye? I only, mean, only I black can... or brown. But I, 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 could, I could always dye my hair black again. I did that in high school. How about hair dye that could be potentially conductive? <gasps> what? Uh <-huh. laughs> what would I use that for? <laughs> for good or for evil? evil? I know. What would you do? How Instead would of you... spiking hair, <laughs> you could just... Like, use have... it as a spiker. <laughs> yeah, you could just have like this static electricity hair standing mm -hmm. straight up, right? Well, actually, not static electricity hair. It would be conductive and not actually... Uh, conducive to static electricity. So published, studied in the journal Chem this last week, researchers in uh, materials science and engineering at Northwestern's McCormick School of Engineering have reported on their adaptation of graphene to make hair dye and to solve the problem of like the toxicity that's involved in a lot of the hair dyes and also the the fading of color they have an ink formula from the they're using the natural ge geometry of the graphene sheets to actually instead of the way that hair dye normally works you have to damage the hair usually there's some kind of peroxide or something that yeah, opens up out so that that opens up the, the hair out. shaft right because you think of it as all these the, each hair is actually like a bunch of little scales that are layered on top of each other and they're kind of sit tightly on top of each other and so you have to rip it open to be able to get small molecules of color to sit within those scales to actually connect to that piece of hair to make it look a different color and what could go wrong? <laughs> right. So many times you dye your hair and there's a lot of damage that goes on and people have frizzy hair afterwards and they're like, well, oh, my hair changed color, but it's all frizzy now. And if I take a bath, it feels like straw. And this is a potential solution to that because the sheets of graphene, instead of jamming into each piece of hair, it would nicely wrap around. Oh, I like that coat the hair and wrap around it and they have found this uh this formula that it uh it's it incorporates edible non-toxic pol polymer binders to make it stick but it all lasts at least 30 washes which is the requirement for a commercial permanent hair dye it's anti-static so it will keep your flyaway hairs <laughs> to a minimum on those really staticky dry winter flyaway days or every day of my life <laughs> <laughs> that's right so far they really it's graphene so they've got black or really dark brown but that's I mean, the only color but they're working all of it. high school and much of college i dyed my hair blue black yeah but they're tight the, their their study it's titled multifunctional graphene hair dye yeah what are they and doing with they, it <laughs> and they say yeah uh, people could apply this dye to make hair conductive on the surface. It could then be integrated with wearable electronics or become a conductive probe. We are only limited by our imagination. A conductive probe, you say? <laughs> <laughs> what? So it's so your that, hair. Your hair could be a solar panel. <laughs> That's right. Well, it could be connected to a solar panel and it could connect... It, your hair could be the connector between a solar panel and your cell phone. I don't know. Or it could you could throw away your earbuds, just stick your hair in your ears. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> beep 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 beep. beep. Yucky. Yeah, this brings new meaning to the tinfoil hat. It's oh, the interesting. It's the opposite of the tinfoil hat. <gasps> yeah, could you um, kind of broadcast noise? Right. So that nobody could read your read your mind, man. Man, <laughs> they can't listen because I'm so loud, man. <laughs> uh. <laughs> All right, those are my stories for the night. Larry, Lovely have some more news. Yes, you know, being fat makes food not taste as good. What? Let me explain. A March 20th study uh, found from Cornell University found that inflammation driven by obesity reduces the number of taste buds on the tongues of mice. 
So each taste bud on your tongue comprises of approximately 50 to 100 cells of three major types. They each have different roles in sensing the five primary tastes, salt, sweet, bitter, sour, and umami. The taste bud cells turn over quickly. They have an average lifespan of just about 10 days. Huh. They took mice. They fed them a 14% fat diet. and That's a normal lab mouse diet or in obesogenic diet of 58% fat. After eight weeks, the mice fed the fat food, weighed about one third more than those receiving normal chow, but the obese mice also had 25% fewer taste buds than lean mice with no change in the size or distribution of the cell types within the surviving buds. So, mm -hmm. yeah, they so explain there, this. There could be some aspect of overeating and that it could be related to the satisfaction that's gained yeah. or the lack thereof. So they don't even anything. mention that in the study. They don't even yeah, dip don't their know. toe into that conversation. But that's what I was thinking about the whole time, too, is are you chasing this, this, um, this taste profile that you no longer have access to and if you want to be able to taste delicious food perhaps you need to slim down a little bit turns out wait, wait, um, okay so wait, 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 wait obviously obviously though these mice aren't selecting their diet no right so this whole idea that because there's less select select uh taste selection that you're eating more to, like it's so it's, that's no, that's, that's a completely it. different study that they did not do but that's what no, what kiki I, was saying might be a next step i think for this study would be to see if you kill taste buds in mice do they eat more food so i don't think that's related at all based on the fact that they just changed the diet of they probably ate the same amount but it was a higher fat content so also knowing my, that mice don't have quite the taste profile perhaps that humans do so it's right it's potentially yeah. not super analogous anyway but what i was going to say though is it might be more along the lines of the body using resources accordingly like hey you know what um we have all these taste buds because it's really important to differentiate this is something i want to eat that's something i don't want to eat this is something i want to eat that's something i don't want to eat but if you're just getting all that you can eat you got plenty uh, coming in and plenty of the you know High fat diet. It's like you know what? Wait, why waste time? So why I actually have potentially an answer. A lot of caloric intake. We're, we'll to why this is happening. So the researchers observed that the rate of cell death, apoptosis, increased in obese mice. So the 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 speed at which taste buds were dying. Remember, I said they turn over every ten days. They were dying sooner in the obese mice, and the number of taste bud progenitor cells, the ones making new cells, also declined. Yeah. So not only were taste buds dying faster, but they were not making taste buds as fast. And they found that mice that were genetically resistant to becoming obese did not show these effects mm -hmm. even on the high fat diet. So it's not due to the consumption of fat. It is the accumulation of adipose fatty tissue. And they know that adipose tissue produces pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are molecules that serve as signals between cells. Yeah, and they all, and they found that the high fat diet increased the level of cytokines surrounding the taste buds, but that mice that were genetically incapable of making the cytokines had no reduction in taste buds despite gaining weight. Yeah. Last... And when they when they injected the cytokines directly onto the tongue of lean mice, the taste buds died. So obesity leads to inflammation, leads to the cytokines, leads to taste bud loss. Correct. Um, but this is an interesting point from the author's summary, because this is a uh, pub pub public library of science biology article, PLOS.org biology. Um, you can read the, sum the article yourself. The author summary says, taste buds operate not only as sensors of essential nutrients, but can also trigger powerful central reward from the consumption of hedonically pleasing food. Obese individuals have been reported to display a weakened sense of taste and thus be may be driven to consume more calories to attain such reward. Our results validate a role for taste in the genesis of obesity and suggest a novel direction in the treatment. 
obesity. Mm -hmm. And they also say that this might help them figure out therapeutic strategies for taste dysfunction, mm -hmm. which is pretty neat. Hmm. Yeah. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. There you go. Taste dysfunction. <gasps> that would be no good. Is that it? Do we have more stories? Who's uh, got more stories? I got one more. Um, <laughs> yeah. So this is kind of fun. They, the, this, uh, a couple of researchers, Jennifer Sheridan out of Yale Nuss, uh, which is a Singapore based sort of like an extension of Yale and Dr. Brian Stewart, research creator of herpetology at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, looked at 400 frogs that were housed in 11 natural history museum collections around the world, looking at what was considered to be two species of Southeast Asian frogs. And they found that there are actually five species and not two, but they again, didn't go to the field. They went to, they went to museum. They went like museum hopping around the world. Uh -huh. They have your finest jars of frogs. <laughs> I am a herpetologist. I would like to see your frog collection, please. Basically, probably not too far off of how it happened. Uh, and they basically say that, uh, yes, early biologists used mainly morphological characteristics. And British herpetologist, physician, and physician Malcolm Smith had noted that the populations of some of these Southeast Asia frogs uh, tended to differ in size and in coloration, but apparently not enough so that he could separate them into um more than just two species but now of course uh science um got dna and stuff uh, it's five species but again what this is one of those things that's sort of an ongoing thing that comes up on the show every once in a while huge scientific discoveries made in a museum collection yeah museum uh, potentially collection. hundreds of years old <laughs> university basement and yeah. you know like all these good thing we had people out there collecting this is all the greatest stuff. hits. We can also throw in there once again. What even is a species? <laughs> uh, the differentiation of a biological creature over time and separation of genetic ancestry. Time yes, and so space, people. Isolated by reproductive incompatibility. Only uh, sometimes. Or not. Or not. <laughs> no, or not. Or not. Only sometimes, it turns out. <laughs> Well, sometimes, we haven't actually tried mating sometimes. all of the animals. We should try, that should be the next step. Yeah. Yeah, but I think these uh, frogs have been in the jars a bit too long. Yeah. It might to not work. It's That's right. Fresh. Five new species. Thank you, Museum Collections. Mm -hmm. Oh, And thank you, everyone out there, for joining us tonight. We have made it to the end of another show. We are here because of you and... Thank you. Thanks to Fada for helping out with social media and to Identity4 for helping out with our audio. And to those of you who are in our chat rooms right now and those of you who are just here with us right now, thank you so much. But thank you most of all for all of you who are supporting us on Patreon. This is the time where I say thank you to Harrison Prather, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Andy Grow, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Ed Dyer, Jacqueline Boyster, Craig Landon, John Ratnaswamy, Paul Disney, G. Burton Lattimore, Richard Onimus, Mark Mazaros, Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill Kay, Bob Calder, Time Jumper 319, Kyle Washington, Eric Knapp, Richard Brian Condren. Richard Porter, RTM, Rick Ramis, Sean Bryant, Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Slazuski, Jim Japok, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Ben Rothig, Steve Lessiman, Kurt Larson, Robert Aston, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie, Gary S., Robert, Greg Briggs, Brendan Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Luthen, Ken Hayes, Matt Sutter, Mac Mark Hessenflo, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, EO, Mark Tyrone Fong, and Keith Corsell. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon. And those of you who are new to that list, it was wonderful to read your names on the list. We love seeing our list of sponsors grow. If you are interested in supporting us, you can find information at twist.org or just patreon.com slash this week in science. And you can also help us out just by telling your friends about twists. We will be back again next week. 
broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time at twist.org slash live. You can watch and join our chat room, which is full of fun people. But don't worry if you can't make it. You can find past episodes at twist.org slash YouTube or just twist.org. Yes, thank you for enjoying the show. Uh, Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory and the This Week in Science app or podcast downloadable thingy, which is free, uh, will be right there. Also, if you have a mobile type device, a phone or pad electronic thing, for instance, you can look for Twist, the number four Droid app in Android marketplaces, or simply This Week in Science and anything Apple marketplacey. For more information on anything you may have heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts. Hey, that's us. And other listeners. Yeah. Or you can just contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at Blair Baz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist TWIS somewhere in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter, where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just better understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. 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 And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our methods that are rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Got the eye. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science, science, science. This week in science. This week in science, science, science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you learn anything from the words that we said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science
This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in 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 science. Hey, chat room. Do you see yourselves? Do you see yourself in twists? <laughs> Such science. So very. Yes. It is. Blair, you're yawning. He's tired. Your mic's turned off. Did you want to hear me yawn? <laughs> No, didn't need that. Nope. Okay. All right. Yeah. Loquacious okay. one. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Okay, I said hi in the chat room. Hi, hey, everybody in the chat room. Private chat. Not anymore. <laughs> I made it not so private. It's private except for the fact that the login information is on our website. <laughs> there is that. Yeah. Anyone can join. Anyone? No, oh, it's getting to that time where the audience is gonna. Uh -huh. Here we go. Here we go. I uh, didn't get to it. Fata had uh, suggested there is the Google Doodle for today, celebrating Mexican astronomer Guillermo Haro. He was an astronomer who in 1959 became the first Mexican elected to the Royal Astronomical Society. And today would have been his 105th birthday. He gives his name along with astronomer George Herbig, to Herbig Haro objects, glowing arcs and splotches of light that come from baby stars. I love baby stars, creating shock waves as they blast out high-speed jets of material into surrounding gas. The relatively short-lived objects point the way to the universe's newborn stars. He also discovered variable, bright variable stars called flare stars in the Orion constellation, which can unpredictably boost their brightness for minutes at a time. That's interesting. Um, that's not the Google Doodle thing that I got up there. Mm -mm. No, mine's uh, Katsuko uh, oh. Saruhushani, who was a female Japanese geochemist who made some of the first measurements of carbon dioxide levels in seawater yeah actually that's the google doodle that i have as well although oh, yeah. it maybe changed. It's, it's switching maybe it, it usually just switches switched. i think um it might switch on the east coast time because i feel like this happens mm -hmm. all the time that because earlier i was seeing the other one and now i'm yeah. not mm -hmm. yes yeah because i see i see a different google doodle at work during the day than when i come home and do twists so i'm guessing it switches over either at nine or at ten so she sounds pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Made the first measurements, some of the first measurements of carbon dioxide levels in seawater, showed evidence in seawater and atmosphere of the dangers of radioactive fallout. Uh, uh, oh, she was born on the 22nd, March 22nd, 1920. Yes. She was inspired by rain. Childhood. Yeah, it, it, Hmm? Oh, go ahead. A childhood experience of watching raindrops cascade down a primary school's classroom window inspired her to enter the sciences. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah, it's her 98th birthday tomorrow. <laughs> it's, it's not the 22nd yet where I am. Huh. She became the first woman to be named to the Science Council of Japan. She was the first woman to win Japan's Miyake Prize for geochemistry as well. 
and um, she was awarded the Sara Saruhashi Award, which was um, from name is named after another female scientist, Ms. Saruhashi, who nurtures other women's careers. Uh, yeah, so she's a female scientist who nurtures other female scientists as well. That's the best. That's the best. Yeah. Ladies helping ladies. That's right. Ladies helping ladies and Guillermo Haro with his baby stars shooting jets of gas. Jets of gas. Stars helping stars, you know. Yeah. Stars helping stars. <sighs> hmm. Um, let's see. Um, what was it that happened recently? Anything else happened that recent recently? I think that we... Or are we tired? Oh, I'm I mean I'm always I'm tired, so <laughs> that's fine. It's fine, don't worry about it. I just have to be to work at seven tomorrow. It's not a big deal. That's early. Seven's early. To go teach some children. <sighs> Growly bear. Yes, stars have gas. That's right. Good night, Fada. Oh, yes. And daylight savings time. That happened. That happened a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. I, it was Bleak was saying, yeah, in Australia, they haven't had it yet. Oh, yes. Which I was haven't... saying when I lived in Israel, it... It happened like several weeks after it happened in the United States. Yeah. So when I mo first moved there, I was 10 hours ahead. And then for a lot, little while, I was 11 hours ahead. And then I went back to being 10 hours ahead. And it was it was a nightmare. <laughs> uh, but I never missed a twist. You never missed a twist. Nope. Is true. No, I think I missed one. <laughs> Oh, Actually, you went on a, a field a trip or line. something. Yeah, I went on a field trip and I tried to join via the bus Wi-Fi, but it was <laughs> it was not possible. No. Yeah. 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 So let's see. I may have a new, I may be moving to the downstairs studio location next week. Oh, yeah. We'll see. We'll see. I'm going to see if I can get it set up. I've got my desk now. I've got camera, the computer, the microphone. I've got backdrops. I could put myself in front of a green screen for everybody. Oh my god, that's so fun! <laughs> that would be a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. Yeah, I'm trying to decide if I'm going to hang up my backdrop again. You can. You're not in this. You're not like in your bedroom with. I know that's the thing. I don't have to you. hide my bed. You're not hiding your bed anymore. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Um, but so far, it's been pretty great. Yeah. Uh, for those of you in the chat room or who are watching right now who also like tech stuff, Daily Tech News Show, I was on it today with Tom. Ooh. And That's Roger fun. and Sarah, it was fun. And I got to talk about soft bodied robots for five seconds. Oh, so you could check out the daily for tech five news whole show. Seconds? Five whole seconds. And no. how long's the whole show? Like an hour? That's a half hour show. It's a half hour? Okay. Yeah. No, it was a little, it was a little longer than five seconds. Just a little bit, though. Yeah. 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 But it, uh, that was fun. So if you haven't heard that, you, it's out and available so you can watch or listen. Yeah, that's always a good show. Um, yeah, I have sec secret schemings now that I have my new computer for other things to do. New shows, things. I need more hours in the day. Don't we all? I know. I need I need more monetary income so I can have the more hours in the day by hiring more people. Oh. <laughs> I will not necessarily have more hours in the day, but I will distribute the hours. 
Just get some real interns. <laughs> right? Yes. Not some washed up zookeeper that says, sure, I'll be your intern. <laughs> Ooh, bleak. I will do. I will uh, talk about the specs when I am down at the computer and can show it off to people. But it is a very fast, wonderful computer. Nice. Yes. Right, Hot Rod. Less sleep equals more hours. But then that leads to me being tired and cranky, which is less fun, Kiki, to be around. Yeah, that's also true. And that's just when I'm standing around going, what? Wait, did I knock my head into the microphone again? Yeah. Yes. Yes, Growly Bear. And also, if there was a way to flip a switch so that you'd know when you were going to have trouble sleeping, so you'd just stay up. That's the part that drives me nuts. Is like, okay, got to get to bed. Got to get to bed. Got to get to bed. Oh, no. I can't sleep. I usually, wow. it usually takes me about five whole minutes to go to sleep and I'm out until my alarm goes off. Um, <laughs> I'm very lucky that way, but that also means that if I ever have trouble sleeping, I am a wreck. I'm a, I'm a monster. <laughs> a monster. Yeah. Oh, Philip Shane is. Oh yeah. And Philip Shane's. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. 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 I, I totally remember this game. It still sticks with me to this day. What is he doing? He, He's doing a documentary on a video game. Which one? Was, it was Mist. called Mist. Oh, Mist! Yeah. And it, that was just such a, a shockingly amazing um, game is almost not even it. I mean, they threw all this philosophy and subject matter and fun and you had like Einstein versus Newton and one of the things was, was really amazing. Um, yeah, I can't wait to see it. Very cool. Right on, Philip. Yeah, that's going to be really awesome. I can't wait to see that when that comes out. Awesome he did Being Elmo? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, Philip, Philip did Being Elmo. Yeah. Holy heck. Hmm. Yeah, he's done some cool documentaries. He's, he's the real a real deal. I knew that, but it's... Philip it's always is, exciting when you're like, oh, no oh, way, really? And now yeah. he's one degree away from Elmo, and you're like, oh, no, that's star power. Yeah, and I'm he just also, saying, it's, like, it's a Sundance film. Like, it was a big deal. Yeah. And he also does a podcast now called What the If, which is fun. It's kind of science and science fiction brought together. And he has fun with that. What the If. He's doing a mist documentary and he's done some other cool documentaries. He did a twist short documentary. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Fun. That was really cool. Yeah. Now we can be like the director of Being Elmo and the Mist documentary made our video. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I've had dinner with him twice. Twice. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, that's rad. I hung out with him and my son put a truck into his chocolate ice cream. Really? That's great. <laughs> I love that. Oh my god. I was little and the <laughs> truck's going right in there. Oh man, I, this just makes me think a bunch about New York too. I want to go back to New York. I would like to go back to New York. I love New York. I want a nice chocolate egg cream right now. I would like to go back to New York, not in the middle of the winter spring yeah. that they're having right now. I've only been there when it's freezing cold. It's It only has two seasons, freezing <laughs> and really hot and yeah. uncomfortable on the subway. No. Yeah. Uh, the spring and the fall in New York City are amazing, beautiful seasons. Yes. Fall in Central Park sounds glorious. It's, it is absolutely glorious. Absolutely is. Yeah. And let's see. What was I going to say about New York? Yeah, we should find a way to go back again. You know, they say it's a concrete jungle where dreams are made up. Dreams are made up. Makes you feel brand new, you know? Only in New York. New you York. Know? New you know? York. 
you know, you know, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, November uh, in New York is we very totally pleasant. Forgot about March before. Mammal Madness. March Mammal Madness. We yes, totally with Katie ha Katie Hind. Mm -hmm. Was that? That was a whole year ago. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. A year ago for it's March Mammal Madness. Yeah. Are they done? No, no, it's uh, not done. No, no, they got a long way to go. But you know, you, you don't start at the beginning of a bracket. No. Oh. Mm. Mm. What was I going to say? New York City has more peregrine falcons than any other place in the world, according to Planet Earth 2, says mm. Ed from Connecticut. Well, they probably have the most pigeons more than any other place in the world, so that would make sense. Makes sense. Delicious pigeons. And they have uptown rats and downtown rats. Yes, that's right. I love that. I know. It's amazing. New York City. What else was I just thinking about New York? There was something that popped in my head and then it went... It fluttered away. Flutter, 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 flutter. Oh, not New York City, but related to the nor'easters that they've been having they, uh, on the East Coast. I think they've had, they're on their fourth nor'easter in March. Jeez. And so it's just snow, 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 snow on the East Coast. But mm -hmm. they're uh, in California, which is actually uh, potentially, hopefully it won't end up so bad, but there's a storm right now in California hitting central and southern California, which was ravaged by fires this mm -hmm. last fall. Um, there is a big storm coming through that could potentially result in flash floods and mudslides in the burned areas because there's no vegetation to help with the water and the keeping of the water in the ground. Yeah. So it could be could be bad, and hopefully it's not. Um, I was laughing because <laughs> um, the there's this phenomenon going on right now in California called rain <laughs> that is breaking people out, and so there is an atmospheric river moving towards Southern California. They've called it Pineapple Express because it's they coming it from Hawaii. This is the happens Hawaii. happens like once a year, twice yes. or at least. The Bay Area is expecting a whopping. I'm trying to find the actual number, but it's like point two to one inches over oh. the next week. They're like, it's a storm. <laughs> no, it's not. Like, no, this is called precipitation. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that I haven't used an umbrella or a raincoat all week because it's just kind of wet out. Yeah. Not sounds, a storm. <laughs> sounds more like Portland. Yeah. Yeah. This is more like what it used to be like in Western San Francisco in my entire childhood. Like, this is just more close to what I'm used to as opposed to this clear, sunny, landscape that we've had the past mm. few years it's super weird to me it's like eerie i walk out the door I go, ah, ah, what is going what on is this? You, can i have my fog back yeah somebody took my fog give me my fog back i want the sweet blanket of fog also because it's not as cold when it's foggy yeah yeah, it does kind of, it's, yeah, it holds the heat in it. It is that blanket. It's a little blanket. It's a little blanket. I mean, it keeps it like this relatively cool temperature, usually in the 50s. Yeah, but it does get any lower than that. It doesn't get any lower, yeah. A couple of weeks ago, it was, um, it was in the low 40s, and everyone was losing their mind. And it was because there wasn't any fog. Ooh, low 40s. Oh, my goodness. I know. Everyone was... Like wearing earmuffs. <laughs> we got uh, we got a bunch of hail last, uh, last week. Before, last week. Oh, what the hail! My littlest <laughs> one went nuts. I yeah. bet it was the first time she'd seen it hailing, and she was just 
running around in it, and then she's running around the house because she got tired of getting hailed on. It was like, it's hailing. She's just screaming, running around. <laughs> it's hailing, it's hailing, it's hailing. At least it doesn't hail like it does in um in like Texas. In the States yeah, where it's and, like the giant tennis balls and golf balls of hail. Those, and it hits so hard, it just like sinks another couple of inches. Just yeah. like that. You're like, I don't want my daughter running around in the hail. Yeah. <laughs> if, it like, if it looks like that. Oh, man. Yeah. Wait, New York City might get over a foot of snow? That's nice. Right. Most snow in one snowfall since March 1869. What? No. What? Crazy. Hmm. 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 I know, identity four. Oh, how cute. A teeny bit of moisture might fall on you, SFers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whatever will we do? I know. Ooh, what? I need some of that special hair dye so the, the frizz doesn't. You do. Graphene hair dye. For sure. Become a giant ball of frizz. I mean, what could you do? If it's not just hair dye, it's this anti-static dye. It could dye... And it's you know potentially edible. Would you put it on your food? Could you? Would it be like your special secret messages that could give send a message to somebody on a piece of toast that they could then eat to, to get rid of the evidence? <laughs> I don't quite know why you would need that. <laughs> That's pretty silly. But I guess need is not really part of the conversation at this point. <sighs> Someone started sending us a message in Facebook in our message box. It says, hi, Dr. Kiki, Justin, and Blair. No. Oh, no. Hi. Uh, hi. hi. Hello. Hi. That stops. Keep sending us a message. Try again. Yeah. I bet they hit uh, enter instead of return or something. Vice versa. I don't know. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, did you see this story, Justin? It was sent by Artyom Dogchev. Dogchev. Um, this shelters. Is a that is not a this is what? a different game than I'm remembering. Missed? That was all. Yeah, it's a different game than then. I was like, oh, that was the most amazing game. It's not the same game as I was thinking. No? M-Y-S-T, right? M-Y-S-T. Yeah. There's only one game called Mist. No, I know. The game I was thinking of, it's the same sort of idea. You're um, like thinking of a knockoff? No, <laughs> You're like, it's I not must a not have played Mist. It was probably, it was probably came out around the same, same time. It might have been later. What was the game that I was thinking of? Oh, I got it. Now I'm going to go crazy. But it was one of those like you had like four, four or five CDs to play through the thing. Same sort of thing. It's pictures and sceneries, and then there's sometimes just puzzles. Ah, but it's not the same one. Mm. Now I'm gonna go crazy trying to remember what the game that I thought this was was. Anyways, wait. Uh, what are you saying? I'm sorry. I was distracted talking. Yeah, to no, there was a story that was sent to us that uh, earlier this month about prehistoric sites and the echoes that they make. Did you ever see that one? Shelters no. with echoes thought to be preferred sites for prehistoric rock art. Hmm. Prehistoric uh, rock concerts. Yeah. yeah. Here, I'll put this, I'll put it in the chat room. Copy paste Ta -da. there's the story the acoustic qualities of a rock shelter may have been a key factor in its selection as a site for rock art and indicate a spiritual significance to the practice according to a recent study while scientists are also looking into whether some caves were chosen as artistic sites because of the view uh, uh, uh. yeah but it's good to look at who knows I mean, you have to, it's science. We have to put forward hypotheses to test them. Uh -huh. But the problem is, is that this is all post facto. I think you could find a correlation now today 
uh, between rock art and uh, a convenient place to get coffee. (laughs) Yeah, possibly. Yeah, but I put I, I, you can read the article if you want to and you're interested in the uh, I don't know, you like that stuff. I thought of you and wanted to pass it along. Yeah. La 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 la. Return to Zork. Oh, Rob, that's funny. Zork. That's an old one. All right. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm going to lose my mind. Well, more than I, more of my mind, I guess. Wow. All right. This is the quiet, tired time, and Blair has to get up early in the morning. So. Yeah, all right. I and I, my brain isn't ticking over very quickly. See how long it took me to say that word, and it's time to go. <laughs> okay. Say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Say good night, Justin. Good night, Justin. <gasps> good night, Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thanks for watching. Thanks for the good show, you guys. Yeah, good. fun one. It was fun. Yeah, we'll be back again next week. <laughs>